Hello, BookTube. I want to finish out a week of tags. I've got the rad pad here, the rad pad freshly cleaned, freshly cleaned and scrubbed. I was getting a little bit impatient with just uh, wiping the, uh, the plastic screen on the other side of this rubberized container. So I took the whole protective layer off to a naked iPad, cleaned the whole iPad, all the dirt and grime that are got into the little nooks and crannies, and cleaned the whole covering, front, back, inside, and outside. Feels like a whole new iPad. Uh, but I, I want to end a week of doing tags. I've been doing tags all week long. I want to end the week with another tag. But this is not one I've been tagged on. This is what I'm tagging all the rest of you on. This is a tag I made up myself. Uh, and it's called the Books and Life Tag. I'm pretty sure I did a little bit of looking around. I'm pretty sure there's never been a tag by that name before. And this consists of exactly the kind of nosy bookish questions that I would ask you if we met in person. <laughs> so I'm curious to know your answers when you get around to it. Uh, question number one, on a scale of one to 10, one being a normal person and 10 being the late Harold Bloom, <laughs> how much are books and reading a part of your life on a scale of one to 10? And for myself, the only reason that I'm giving myself a nine instead of 10 is the reason in the background there is freedom. It's my little freedom. I have anything. I have a girl. You're so sweet. Uh, that's, she's the only reason why I'm giving myself a nine instead of a 10. Because I, I break off significant chunks of every day uh, to spend time with her. To go walking with her this week, it's been way too hot to go for long walks, but also just to spend time in her world, to spend time with her. Uh, and that's the only reason that it's not a 10. It is definitely a nine because literally all the rest of my life is books and reading, all of it. Uh, for those of you who are new to this channel, I am a professional book critic and I am also a working paid print newspaper book section editor for a small newspaper in Northern Georgia. And I do nothing else. I do those two things, though that is what I do. I am an editor and a reviewer. So all I do all day long, every day and all night long, every night is read. And when I'm not doing that, I am writing about what I've read. Uh, so aside from Breaks with Frida, that's all I do. Now, I want to know where you stand on that spectrum. Where would you rate yourself 1 to 10? Uh, then question number two is, where does your personal library stand right now in relation to the rest of your life? Uh, do you have more books now than you've ever had in your life? Do you have fewer books now? How has your library changed over time? Your personal library. Uh, and for me, I don't think that I have uh, a remarkable ex uh, extreme either way. I have about 3,000 books here at Hyde Cottage, not counting the electronic books, of which I have probably another 10,000. Uh, but I have about 3,000 paper and glue books here. And there have been times in my life for which I have horrifying photos, <laughs> just horrifying where I've had probably three times that much. I've been closing in on 10,000 books. If you are a single individual and you have 10,000 books, you have a real problem. Unless you have an, a, a fully reinforced extra building to put them in. If you are literally building a personal library, a literal library, fine. That's just fine. If you're doing that, just fine. But if you're trying to live in a house, especially a house with other people, and you, have, and you are pro approaching 10,000 books, you're in real trouble. <laughs> you have, you have, it is not possible to have a functioning personal library that's that big in such a small space. It, it, will, it, it almost inevitably means that you have thousands of books that you never touch, that you never think about, and that you could get rid of. And I have had periods in my life where that was true, very much so. I've also had periods in my life where it's the exact, the exact opposite, where I was traveling out of one footlocker, which is right down there. And the, I had a, a handful of mass market paperbacks or small mass market hardcover books, about 17 or 18, that I made into a, a tile, a, a mosaic tile, a second floor of that footlocker. And I had them, I had done it so many times that I had their shapes and sizes perfectly known to me. So that when I was, I got to the last one, when I tumped it down like that, the set, that second layer of books was completely solid. You could turn the chest upside down and shake it, and those books would not dislodge. And that was great. I traveled, and I traveled with those books. And that, that, that mosaic worked with always one book left free that was in a pocket or in, a, in a readily accessible satchel fold or something like that. But otherwise, those books were my companions everywhere, on mountain flank, on 
plains of Africa, on the, the, on the desert sands, everywhere. At sea, oh my God, endless hours at sea, but not endless variety, just those books over and over again. Those books, my travel library that I came to know really, really well. And I never, we never wanted for variety. It, it was just not going to be possible the way I traveled, it was just not going to be possible to fill a bag with books at some bookstore in my latest stop. No, no, no. I never added uh, to that store of books unless one of them died, unless one of those books died, unless it went overboard in the Indian Ocean or was destroyed by a beagle or a wild animal or something like that. And if it was, usually I could go without, but if I didn't want to go without, I could find a replacement for that volume somewhere. Uh, so I've been at both those extremes. Right now, I am not. About 10 years ago, I made the decision uh, to get rid of books, to get rid of a lot of books, a lot of them, uh, so that there weren't double-stacked hardcovers on every single flat surface everywhere, so that there weren't bookcases towering to the ceiling with stacks and stacks of books in the kitchen, in the bathroom, in the hallways. I decided about 10 years ago to just do away with that, just stop that completely, and to be constantly thinning things out. Uh, so you, you don't see the, the thinning side. I don't do unhauls on this channel, but you do see the growing side. I get books at the Brattle Bookshop. I haven't this week because it's been murderously hot here in Boston. I haven't bothered. I haven't gone anywhere in that kind of weather. I wouldn't want to leave Frida anyway, even though the weather is comfortable for me. Uh, but even even though you see those uh, those acquirings, I, there's also, I'm also shedding books. I'm getting rid of them. They're going out the back door as well. With, it, with the goal being to have my goal is two or three thousand books, never much more than that, uh, and to have the the books that are here be fine tuned to perfection, so that I, they're, so they're ones I really want. Uh, so, it, I, in answer to this question, my library has fluctuated wildly over time. Sometimes it has been absolutely freakishly enormous. There were times where I had five or six thousand mass market paperbacks alone. And, and then there were times when I was traveling when I had only 17 or 18 books. That was it. I, you could say, well, you had a library back at home, but there was no guarantee that I was coming back home or that I could come back home safely. So the, as far as I was concerned, the books that I had were the ones I had with me. Right now, I'm in a kind of comfortable middle position. The books here are not out of control. They are not colonizing spaces where they don't belong. They are not stacked on the floor, a key sign of trouble. They are not double stacked. I can look at my books and see what I have, and that, except for I have a bookcase of mass market paperbacks, where those are double double stacked. But otherwise, everything else here is the way it should be. The hardcovers and trade paperbacks are the way they should be. The, the, the collection here, although I do constantly get books at the battle at the Brattle Bookshop and elsewhere, I am constantly shedding them as well, so that the collection here is under control. Uh, so that's where my library is now. It's it's in a good place. I I kind of like where it is, uh, but I want to hear about you. Uh, then question number three is, take a mental step back and ask yourself this question. What is the most likely first bookish impression that a newcomer would have in your home? So not their first impression of your dog or your cat or your, your, yourself. What would be their first bookish impression of your home? And it can be anything, that, whatever you think their first impression would be. Uh, will their first impression be, oh my God, this is a hoarder? This is, this is way, way too many books in no order, piled everywhere. Will they actually think that if you take that big mental step back? <clears throat> Will their first impression be, uh, this is a shallow reader? This is, this is someone who might have a few books on shelves, but who clearly doesn't read very deeply or very widely. Uh, will, it, will the first impression be that the books here are mainly used by the children in the house? Are those the most prominent thing, the most visible thing? Will, will the impression be the books here are, are very much the possessions of a collector? They're all uniform, they're all gorgeous, they're all dusted, they're all behind glass, they're in cases, things like that. <clears throat> and I think for me, and this isn't just speculation on my part, this is also gleaned from having guests and asking them this question, asking them what your first impression is. The first impression that, that most people give when they come and look at the books here is that this is a working library. There's no uh, even set. There's no there's no uh, homogeneous feel to the library. It's it it very much looks like it was assembled by someone who is actively reading it, actively using it. And I've had friends who who visit 
you know, one year and then they don't come back for another year or they come back six or four months later. And one of the first things that they always used to say is, wow, the books aren't in the same places. And it's not that you've redecorated. It's that you, you've been using them. They've, they've clearly been used. You, a book has been pulled down and put back somewhere else. Books have been grouped together and then in little ways, in ways that don't say house cleaning, but rather say, okay, this is, this is an actively used library. Uh, I think that is the first impression that uh, that my books tend to give, and I even think for a couple of people who have been here often enough and have uh, been observant enough, most people who come to your house don't notice the books because most people don't read. But I've had some people come here who were observant enough to notice that the feel of the books is different in my little book room as opposed to any other room in Hyde Cottage. The rest of the rooms in Hyde Cottage feel more like a used bookstore. There's a kind of order to them. There, there's a kind of grouping to them. Whereas the little book room, the books rate one. I had one guest say they radiate love. Uh, not to say that you don't like all your books, but the books in this room feel loved. It feels like that's why they're here, and that is very much the case. So that was that was wonderful to hear. But that's obvious. Uh, but I want to know if you like, for instance, you don't have to guess if people have given you their first bookish impressions when they walk into your house. I'd love to hear what they are. I'm just that nosy. Uh, then question number four is how often, if ever, do you clean or reorganize your books? Be honest here. How often do you clean your books? How often do you take them down, dust them off, clean the shelves, check them for mold or, or uh, silverfish or anything like that? And how often do you reorganize them? How often do you move them around? Uh, and for myself, I, I am not a great neat freak. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not disposed that way at all. It's yet another canine trait. Fortunately, I have, I have a surly houseboy who takes care of things like that so that there's never any... It's, this is never, you know, the abode of Shelob. <laughs> never, there's never any grotesqueries here. The books are well-maintained. I'm mighty hard on them, but that's not a question of housekeeping. That's just a question of how I handle them when I grab them and throw them around. <laughs> But they are they are uh, fairly neat and clean, and every once in a while, the yen will take me to reorganize, usually for some specific reason. Uh, just recently, the most recent example is was the, I had a, a shoulder-high bookcase in the little book room that was full of books about my own profession, books of collected book reviews, book prefaces, book essays, uh, author memoirs, publishing memoirs, that sort of thing, all in one book that came up to, one case that came up about my, my shoulders. And that case was ridiculously overcrowded, just ridiculously. So books double and triple stacked, books jammed in edgewise into any space that would fit. I eventually decided that what I needed to do was rearrange the books out in the this outer room, where I spend most of my time anyway. Uh, so I picked a big floor-to-ceiling bookcase, something with 30% more room than the other one, pulled everything off that and redistributed all those books elsewhere and brought all of those bookish books out to that bookcase. And for about five seconds, that plan worked perfectly. And all of those books fit perfectly and it was a, a marvel of orderliness. And then those kinds of books just kept coming. And now that bookcase is ridiculously overcrowded, just ridiculously so. And there aren't any bigger bookcases. So I clearly need to colonize a second bookcase and just put them side by side, and maybe that won't be long enough. But one way or another, that happens periodically with me, and I want to know how often it happens with you. Are you are you always going at your books and fiddling with them, or do have they sat where they are for uh, forever and ever? Uh, then question number five is, on average, how many books do you acquire in a given week? No matter how it is that you acquire them. So the one... The one bar here would probably be libraries, since you're not acquiring those. But if you want to include libraries, then tell me about your library use. But I'm talking here about books that you that you acquire to own. On average, in a week, about how many books do you acquire? Uh, and feel free to tell me the ways that you acquire them. If you if you are watching this channel, then you know uh, the ways that I do. I occasionally will splurge on books that I order online, either new or you new on Amazon or used on eBay. But most of my books come to me either through the Brattle Bookshop, a great used bookstore here in Boston, or in the mail from publishers. And once upon a time, before the COVID-19 pandemic, those numbers weren't even <laughs> at all. Before, before COVID-19, when people 
when publicists were still in their offices at publishers, as you saw, if you watched my channel back then, I would get big plastic mail tubs full of books every day. And th those numbers, I got uh, 200, 300 books a week that way. And I certainly didn't buy 200 or 300 books a week at the Brattle Bookshop or any other used bookstore. Now, the numbers are much closer to being even. I, I still get books regularly in the mail every day. And I go to the Brattle Bookshop as often as is convenient. So those numbers, those are the two places, and those are about average. I would say probably now uh, my average for a week is 100 books, maybe 80 books, something like that. Taking in all of the different, uh, those two different main ways, I'd say somewhere between 50 and 80 books a week. Uh, again, with the, with the key component being that I'm also getting rid of books every week. <laughs> so those things aren't piling up on the kitchen floor. But I want to hear from you. Where do you get your books? Where do you acquire them? And about how many a week? Is it, for instance, a big deal for you to get a book in a week? One book? Is, is it when you get to the end of a week, do you feel like maybe it's a little bit disappointing that you got no books that week? Is it closer to 10? Uh, is there, for instance, a ritual that you have? Maybe you have a boring office job and you reward yourself on Friday by getting some books, by swinging by the bookstore and getting some books. I want to hear, I am infinitely curious about all those kinds of things, so feel free to tell me. Uh, and question number six is not exactly book related, it just happens to be on my mind, and since I'm indulging in nosiness, question number six is what song is your current earworm? An earworm is the, the colloquial term for the song you can't get out of your head. <laughs> what is your current earworm? And for a long time, for the last few days, my earworm, for whatever reason, I have no idea why. We never know how we pick these things up. I have no idea why, but for some reason, for the last few days, my earworm has been Piano Man by Billy Joel. Over and over and over and over again. A not particularly objectionable song, except for the usual shortcomings of Billy Joel songs. Number one, it's, it's full of stupid nostalgia. And number two... It really thinks rather highly of Billy Joel. <laughs> Other than that, it's a fairly pleasant song, but after a couple of days, I'd had enough. And with earworms, you never know when it's going to go away. You never know what's going to replace it, and whether or not what replaces it might be worse. In my case, my new earworm, again, I have no idea where it comes from, why it is so, is something called the Hand Song. H-A-N-D, the Hand Song, from a, a trio that no longer performs, Nickel Creek, a bluegrass trio. A uh, brother and sister, and then uh, a third player. Uh, and the hand song is lovely. I, I'm not. I'm not objecting to it being my earworm. It's. It's a Christian song. Kind of sticks out like a sore thumb on the album where it occurs because it's an explicitly Christian song. Uh, that is lovely and very sweet. It, it's a, a a Christian sort of allegory that runs throughout it. It's a short song. It's. It, it's a kind and adorable and catchy in its own way. It's not nearly as catchy as other songs on that same album, and yet it's playing in my head over and over and over again. No idea why, and no idea what will replace it. But if it's going to be my misery to have an earworm, I want to know yours, <laughs> so feel free to tell me. Uh, and I'll just hope that yours doesn't become mine, because that is the risk you run. Although I don't think many of you know Nickel Creek or will have known this song. Uh, and then question number seven is, what percentage of your self-control do you retain in a well-stocked bookstore. So again, we could do this on a scale, <laughs> right? When you go into a well-stocked bookstore, either a, a new retail bookstore that is not, you, most retail bookstores are fairly poorly stocked, but if you were to go into a retail bookstore that was really well-stocked, but I'm thinking more something along the lines of the Book Barn in Niantic, Connecticut, or my very own Brattle Bookshop, or the Strand in New York City. In other words, a second-hand bookstore that is stocked to the rafters with things, an infinite variety, where it would take you forever to go through the stock. When you go into a place like that, how much of your self-control do you retain? Do you retain, I, I think, if you're watching this video, you probably, the answer to the question, do you retain all your self-control, is probably no. I don't think there's anybody out there that retains 100%. But what is the percentage? Do you lose it all? Do you become just a, a helpless basket case that you're, where your friends have to find you after half an hour and say, look, we're leaving? <laughs> do, is that the case? Or do you retain some modicum of self-control where, where, okay, I know I've been here a long time and I have a huge pile and I can tell that my friends are a little bored, just a little bit longer, and then I will make myself go to the cash register. Is it that? 
is it 20, 30 percent? I want to know your percentages. My own answer to this question, when it's a really well-stocked bookstore, uh, provided my needs are met. In other words, uh, provided in in ye olden days, provided my dogs were somewhere being well cared for. That had to happen. Otherwise, self-control wouldn't be the issue. I would I would want to leave. Uh, or in these modern times where I don't actually leave Frida uh, with anybody, then it would be, is she safe alone or is she with me? <laughs> and if she's safe alone, well, that's still going to put a, a little bit of limit on my self-control. That's going to mean that I'm, I'm not going to be just free to spend hours anywhere. If she's with me, well, then I can go a good long time, a very good long time. So I would say that my, in a really well-stocked place, my self-control wavers to around 75%, and I want to know yours. And be completely honest, because you're among friends. Uh, then number eight is, do you ever feel the need to take a break from books? And if you do, what form does it take? And I do, and I've already mentioned my form, I spend a chunk of every day, many little chunks of every day, in Frida's world, not mine. Her world is my original world, a world that has no language of the human kind, that has no words, that has no books, that has no literature, no writing, no printing, no nothing. Uh, it's full of concepts. It's full of language, yes, but not English or any other uh, structured, you know, written on a page language. And that world is incredibly refreshing for me. Sometimes I spend it just with Frida. When we're out and about, I share that world with other dogs that we meet, to the point of exclusion of their humans, several of whom have, have mentioned it to me, never in an angry way. But I've, well, I've lost count over the years that I've been here of how many humans have come up to me. When I'm walking to some sort of appointment and I don't have Frida with me, uh, when they are walking their dogs and I, I you know, crouch down and face smooch with their dog, and I stand up laughing and smiling, and I've lost count of how many humans on this street, in this neighborhood, have just offhandedly, without offense, mentioned, you know, you always say hi to my dog before you say hi to me. And a lot of times you forget to say hi to me. You just stand up smiling, laughing, and then wave goodbye to the dog and keep walking without even noticing that I'm there. And I've apologized to everybody, and I've had so many humans on, in this neighborhood say, no, no, I'm not mad. It was obviously not a slight. You were obviously just besotted, and so was my dog, who missed you all day long. Uh, uh, so I, I enter into that world not only with Frida, but with other dogs, but I do it all the time. I do it steadily throughout the day. The longest stretch of time when I don't take a break from books is at night. Every night at midnight, I turn into a pumpkin. I turn off the whole of the world. I, my, my dogs, if I'm lucky, are asleep peacefully. I have 10 more years of that being true for Frida, and then nights will start to be trouble. Uh, but one way or another, for, for now, I'm taking it, definitely taking it. If I can get it, I'm taking it. Uh, and for those eight or nine hours, I do nothing but read. But during the day, I take breaks from reading all the time. I'm not 100% sure that I need them. I find reading an infinitely, an infinite variety of an experience. So I'm not sure that I always, I might need a break from one particular book, often go straight to another particular book. But one more, whether I need the breaks or not, I love them. <laughs> and I want to know about you. Do you ever need to take a break from books and just not maybe not read for a day or not read for a couple of days to recharge your batteries? I'm not sure if that's true, and I want to know. Uh, then question number nine is, when you meet a new person, how long does it take you to bring up books? And I never do it. I, I, unless the other person brings up books, I never do. I always am mindful of the fact that almost nobody reads. Most people in the world not only never read for pleasure, but would rather die than read for pleasure. Read than read voluntarily. They don't know that they're getting any pleasure out of it. But if you were to tell most people in the world, if you were to say, your choice is to read Jane Eyre, or I will use this shotgun to blow your head off, the person would say, all right, well, give me a couple of minutes to put my affairs in order and then blow my head off. Because that is preferable to me to reading Jane Eyre. Most people in the world, and I'm talking 90% of the people in the world, at least 90% of the people in the world, feel that way about reading. It's not just they don't get around to it or they don't have the time or they weren't inculcated into loving it. It's that they actively hate it and never do it. So I always operate on the assumption that anyone I'm meeting on the sidewalk, whether they seem nice or not, hasn't read a book since they were forced to do so in their senior year of high school and doesn't want to hear about books in any way. So I never bring it up. 
and I'm curious to know if you do. Uh, question number 10, only a couple more, that, don't worry. Question number 10, have you given any thought or made any provisions for your personal library after you pop your clogs, after you croak, after you shuffle off this mortal coil? I, I'm assuming that a lot of you are watching this channel are young, so a lot of you are industriously working right now on acquiring the lung cancer that will kill you in your, your mid-50s. So if you're in your late teens, early 20s, then that's not that long off. That, that's, that's only 30 years away. And the last five years of those are going to be in an agony that's greater than anything that Dante ever imagined. So I'm assuming that you are industriously working on giving yourself lung cancer right now as we speak. And you have a book collection. What are your thoughts about that? Or if you're not young, if you're if you're a little older, what are your thoughts on your book collection? Do you have pretensions to hold it together after you're gone? Do you have a desire to do that? Are you hoping you can pass it on to somebody? Uh, I have no thoughts on the subject whatsoever myself. I have no thoughts along those directions at all. I have been going to the Brattle Bookshop here in Boston for far too long to have any but the most cynical viewpoint about what happens to our books after we die. <laughs> what happens to our books after we die is the Brattle sale lot. $5 sticker right there on the front cover. $3 sticker right there on the face of the woman on the front cover. A $1 sticker on top of the 5 and the 3 because they didn't sell it 305. And at the back of the lot, behind a chain link fence, there's a dumpster. That is the fate of your library. I have seen so many libraries go that way, and I know they're libraries because they had book plates. They had obviously been carefully, meticulously assembled over years, decades. They'd obviously, because of the annotations and the bookmarks and the ephemera inside, they'd obviously been loved and cherished and used in all those times. The minute the ventilator stops, your relatives, who never understood your love of books, only want the things out of here. Just get them out of here. Just get them out of the house. How many sail runs has the Brattle crew gone on to houses just like that and stood there seeing room after room of packed, loved bookcases, the ones that did give that first impression that I described. Here is a used, a heavily used, actively loved book collection. How many times have the Brattle crew gone into houses like that, seen that collection, and then dealt with an impatient relative who's never touched those books and never will and just wants a check to get them gone? Just get them out of here. You don't even have to assess them for individual value. I just want them gone. I want to knock down this wall and make a solarium. Or I want to sell the house, and I can't have these eyesores here while I do it. That is the fate of your book collection. You don't like to think it, and I don't like to think it either, but in 99.9% .9 of cases, that's what's going to happen to your books. Uh, and I'm wondering if you fight against that. Have you maybe made arrangements for a younger friend to inherit your library? Have you maybe had discussion with a younger relative to inherit your library? Is there some idea of you maintaining the shape or character of your library after you're no longer around to do it yourself? I'm curious to know. A little bit macabre, but we won't end on a macabre note. We'll end on uh, question number 11. Uh, are you known among your friends and loved ones for your weird and probably unhealthy relationship with books? Do they know you for that? You, when your friends and relatives think of you, do they think about books? And in my case, yes. <laughs> yes, they do. Except for the friends who aren't human. I have many, many friends in this neighborhood that I keep, I keep track of them. I keep, I keep uh, updated with them every single day, probably several times a day. And they don't know what a book is, and they don't want to know. And they don't care, and they don't associate with me that. They associate me with Frida, uh, where they beg, grovelingly beg her permission to can they approach me and slurp my face if they don't ask her permission she reads them the riot act if they do she'll maybe let them do that always with a look on her face of why would you want to lick his face i lick his face every day it's there all the time what's your problem i'm not going to try and explain anything to her but if it's not those people if it's humans then yeah virtually every human that i know associates me with books and reading virtually everyone that i does but but that is the product of a lot of selective shaping I have shaped my world so that that is true. I mostly know bookish people, people who are involved in the bookish world in one way or another, authors, publishers, publicists, editors, reviewers, writers. I mostly know those people. So it, I, I associate them with books as well. It just stands to reason. Most of the people that I know uh, 
a little bit better than just acquaintances, associate me with a workhorse amount of books and writing. They associate me with doing a lot of reading, a lot of writing. But, uh, but everybody associates me. Everybody, every human that I know associates me with books in one way or another. And I'm curious to know about you. Do you compartmentalize? Or does everybody in your life basically know, oh, yeah, the reader? I'd love to hear that. I want to hear the answers to all of these questions. So I'm not going to tag anybody. I'm going to tag all of you. Anyone who's listening to me who likes occasionally to read a book. <laughs> if that description fits you, if books are part of your life, then I would like you if you would do the books and life tag. Uh, and I'm going, to, I'm going to post this. I'll post the questions down below. And that is it. Uh, for me, for tags for this week. <laughs> so we will see what the weekend brings. Aside from unsettled weather, thunder, lightning, rain, and maybe a significant drop in temperature. Aside from that, we'll see what bookish stuff we can do this weekend. Uh, and I'll see you then. Thank you, Book 2.